Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So, we've referenced that verse 2 uh, quite a few times, um, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, and the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Um, we go, we got to remember who, who the writer is uh, writing to. Um, the recipients of the letter are Jewish converts to Christ who are being persecuted. So this chapter, or at least what today, this message we're going through, is about um, discipline and dealing with discipline and punishment and um, things like that. And so he, he tries to give them encouragement and tells them that we have purpose in uh, discipline. There's purpose in it. There's a reason why God disciplines us, and there's a reason why us parents discipline our kids. Yeah. So there's no there's no reason why our Father in Heaven wouldn't discipline His children. Mm -hmm. So when it says that we are surrounded by witnesses, uh, you know, not only uh, are we surrounded by fellow Christians, um, we're also surrounded by uh, the world. The world's looking in on us, right? If anybody says uh, that you're a Christian in the public place, or your workplace, or neighborhood, or whatever it is, all of a sudden you're you're put on a pedestal, a moral pedestal, and rightly so, because if we're supposed to be um, examples of Jesus Christ, who's a moral standard, who says, "I have a better way," right? I have the way, the truth, and life. We say we're followers of that person. Christian is little Christ. We're naturally going to be put on a pedestal, are we not? So whether you like it or not. That's why we have to live life to a higher standard. That's why the Bible says keep yourself unspotted or unstained from the world. And what I always think about when, I, when the scripture says that is uh, when you're walking into like a freshly painted room, you walk in there with, and you got clothes on, you're walking in like this, making sure you don't touch anything. You're in the room, but you don't get the room on you. And the same thing, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We keep ourselves unspotted from sin and the things that the world has to offer because otherwise we're going to look just like the world. If we say we have a, a greater message, if we say we're redeemed uh, and our Redeemer saves and we're living like the rest of the world, what's it say about the Redeemer? Or what's it say at least about us Christians who are trying to represent? So we're surrounded by witnesses, as it says in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight. So the cloud of witnesses not, is not only present-day Christians and the world looking in on the fishbowl of a Christian life, but it's also, when he says, therefore, he's referring to the last chapter. He's continuing on. They didn't have chapters when they are writing these things. So he's continuing on his thought, therefore, to what? The chapter 11, the, the heroes of faith, the chapter of faith, the hall of faith, all the people he just got done talking about and listing in chapter 11, what we talked about the last couple, two, three weeks, that cloud of witnesses too. Also the ones who have ran before us. So present day, Christians and not, and also the ones who ran before us, who ran the race, looking upon us, gazing upon us, seeing us Christian running the race, and through this chapter, we see the uh, the writer of Hebrews using like athletic terms throughout this uh, chapter twelve here. So we see um, again, therefore, since we're surrounded by so so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So, you see, endurance, that's something that's many times used in an athletic sense, right? You have to have endurance if you're going to finish the race, complete the race, at least in, in a competitive manner, manner. So, when it says, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Think about this when swimmers are racing, right? They're running 
or they're not running, but they're swimming their laps. <laughs> they're running in the water with their arms. Uh, so when they're swimming, they wear things that have the least resistance as possible, right? Speedos and very tight fitting things and the, you know, the caps, the swimmers caps. And they, they, they go all out because they want the least amount of resistance as possible in that water. So they can endure, so they could be fast, they could be uh, efficient, and they can endure the race. So when imagine jumping into the water with all your clothes on, with what you're wearing right now. At the very best, you're going to get worn out very fast, right? You, you might, you could finish the, the, the race if you're swimming with the other swimmers, but you're going to be very slow, you're going to finish last. Uh, the worst is you're going to drown. Because these clothes are just going to sink you and pull you down and you're going to drown. So when it says lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to us, imagine jumping in a pool with all your clothes on. It sticks to you, right? It clings tightly to you and it's this weight that's pulling you down. And it's the same thing with sin in our lives when we're running this race when we're called life. And we're trying to endure all the obstacles that life throws at us, all the obstacles in our family, in our work, health, that Satan throws at us, spiritual warfare, all these things. And he's saying sin is like wet clothes on a swimmer. At best, you're just going to be tired and worn out. And at worst, you're going to stop before you reach your goal. And this is what the writer is saying here. The sin clings tightly to us. It keeps us defeated. It keeps us from having endurance. It it gets us gassed out along with many other things. When your cardio isn't up to par, you're gassed out. You get gassed quickly, right? You know, you can't endure. And that's what sin does in our life. We already got enough issues in life not including sin that clings to us or that we hold on to. And many times we hold on to it and it sinks us and it kills us. And you look at Christians that have completely defeated lives that, that are struggling with the same thing for years and years and decades and they they're always seem defeated and they're always consumed with worry and they always, because they're not shedding these sinful things, these things like worry and depression, anxiety, and although those things aren't sinful in themselves, but they can be if they overshadow and take control and a stronghold in your mind. They can be sinful things. Just like anger in itself isn't sinful, but how I let that control me can be sinful. How I react to certain things, how I, if I lash out with anger, so these things are only like wet clothes. Let us run the race of endurance, the race that is set before us. It's not a sprint. When he's talking about this race, I don't look at it as a sprint, this 100-meter dash where you just give it all you can and, and then you stop. And I also don't see it as a marathon because a marathon has a finish line. Although life may seem like a marathon, it has a finish line on these races. The finish line in life isn't death. The finish line in life isn't retirement. It's not when you become an empty nester. There is no finish line for the Christian. Because for death means the start of eternal life. It's the start of something greater. There's no finish line. There's no stopping point in the Christian's life. There's no point where she'd ever say, look, I served in ministry X amount of years. I'm good. I did my, I sowed my seed in the ministry. I'm okay. And then what? You do nothing with the rest of your life? You're a closet Christian then because you've, you got your tenure in Christianity? (laughs) Now you're set for life, huh? Just cruise control? There's no finish line. Death isn't the finish line. That's why I don't see it as a marathon. I see it as a relay race. A relay race, you keep running, and eventually you're going to pass on something valuable to somebody else. And that person keeps running. 
you pass the mantle on to somebody else. Your kids, your dis- discipleship partners, mentors, the circle of influence, your oikos, you're passing the, the baton on. You're leaving a legacy for people. And what you leave for the next generation continues on to the next generation and continues on to the next generation. When you raise your children right, which we're going to be getting into today, and you don't say, I'm done once they leave the house. No, you're there the rest of their life. Any empty nesters could uh, say amen to that? My dad's like, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. It's a baton. You're passing the mantle on. Amen, church? A legacy you're leaving behind, and that should be everyone's mentality. No finish line, a legacy. In 1 Timothy 6.12, I'll just read it off to you. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith and take hold of eternal life. Not take hold of the finish line. Take hold of eternal life because at death it starts. There's this illustration that uh, I forgot who did it, but he, ha- he, had, he brought a rope up on stage. And the rope went off all the way outside of view. And at the very tip of the rope was a little red, painted red this much. And he said, this red piece is your life. 60, 70, 80, 90, whatever years. And the white part that went all the way 30, 40 feet is eternity. And kept going. Put it into perspective, it kind of, like, wait, wait a second. What we do here matters for an eternity. And that's why it's important for us to establish a godly baton, a Christ-like baton we could pass on to the the next racer. We've done it. We've been there. Keep going. And this is what he's telling the recipients of this letter. So instead of looking to a finish line, Look to Jesus, the perfecter and the founder of our faith. For the, the, the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. <clears throat> all right. So no slides today. It's all right. You guys got your Bibles? Yes, all right. We'll just keep going. So. We keep our eyes on Jesus because he's the target. Just like when we're playing, just like when we're throwing a ball, right? Or, um, you know, bowling ball. I went bowling last weekend, and uh, I'm horrible uh, at it, just so you guys know. Fun-filled fact. Uh, Any sport with solid or hard balls, pool, golf, bowling, I'm horrible at. I think, I don't know, it must be genetic because I just can't. I don't know. Is it genetic? He's like, no. So it's just me. All right, that's cool. Um, any sport with hard balls, it's just like, okay, just stop. Uh, so bowling, though, you look where you're, you want to hit, right? You're not looking at this lane over here because then you're in a blooper reel. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't me, but I'm just saying people end up in blooper reels. When you're throwing a ball, you step, right, and you look at your target, where you want to hit. When you're throwing knives or axes, right, you step, you look, you throw, and you hit the target. Jesus is our target. That's what we're looking to. We're not looking to the circumstances, how hard life can be, not negating that we have difficulties, but keeping our eyes focused on Jesus, the target. Because that's, that's what sanctification is, Right? Conforming into the image of Christ. So when we look unto him, regardless of what's going on, our identity is found in something outside of ourselves. So no matter what happens around us, we're still anchored in something greater than us. The author and the finisher of our faith. Remember a couple, uh, last couple weeks we talked about how important faith was. So going on, if you're um, still in chapter 12, let's go to verse 3. Considered him, verse 3 to 4, considered him who endured from sinners 
such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood so these two verses are most likely in reference to the sins that are committed against the recipient of this letter remember they're persecuted for their faith they converted from judaism they're in hiding many times they went down by the river and the houses to worship and um they're not only exiled, but they're also persecuted to the point of shedding blood, to the point of death. And he's saying, look, consider him who endured for sinners with such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted." Look, Jesus did it. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus suffered. And guess what? If you're going to be a follower of Jesus who suffered, suffering's going to come to you. What did, what did Jesus say? The world will hate you because they hated me first, because they hated the truth that came into the world that shed light on the darkness and the darkness of sin, and people love the sin rather than the truth, right? So they hate the truth. Do we not see that today? Just look at the news for a little bit. Truth doesn't matter anymore. If you speak something true that exposes flashlight on something dark, they shut it down. They shut it down. Doesn't matter if it's true or not. Is it shining light on a dark place? So, he's exhorting them to endure. Again, looking to Jesus, right? And this is something that when somebody brings an objection against, because the resurrection, our Christianity is, is focused around the resurrection, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. This is all useless, right? He had to raise from the, from the dead for this to mean anything, to, to, for Jesus to really be God in the flesh. So when people make objections to the resurrection and they say, well, the disciples, because if Jesus never really rose, he's either still in the ground or somebody stole his body or whatever. So the, so the disciples just continue to fake it because it was too embarrassing for them to, to recant all that and go back on it, right? It would be embarrassment to say, you know what? This really all was just a sham, and we were going along with it for whatever reason. And now that he's dead and he didn't rise like he said he would, you know what? This is just a false thing. They said that they were just continued to, to fake it because it was gaining popularity. That doesn't make sense because the disciples and the followers of Christ had nothing to gain from following Jesus. Besides the spiritual aspect, but I'm talking about from a, a social aspect, they had nothing to gain. Think, look at, let's look at church history and history and what's in the scriptures. When Jesus died and the church was started, the church was scattered because people were dying, like Stephen the martyr. Christians were headhunted. What is there to gain to hold on to a lie that you know about? Because you're, you're embarrassed? I'm sorry, my life's more important than embarrassment. It doesn't make sense for you to hold on to a lie if Christianity wasn't true. Christianity had to be true, and Jesus really had to rise from the dead for people to die for their beliefs and get slaughtered and families to get slaughtered. Because even at the spark of Christianity at the beginning, that would have been the easiest time to snuff it out before it spread. And it didn't. They continued to preach the word of God regardless. I mean, look at Paul. Regardless of getting beat, stoned, imprisoned, destitute without food or clothes. I mean, he, he dealt with it all and martyred. Doesn't make sense to just hold on to some, a lie like that. In verse 5, Hebrews 12, verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which we have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. See, the writer is connecting discipline with sonship. Discipline of a child 
with sonship to the Father, and he uses Proverbs 3, that's what he's quoting, to, as a reference. See, it's expected for the Father to correct the children, or the head of the house. If there's no father present, then obviously the mother isn't, or if you're a grandparent raising the kids, you know, whoever's the head of the house, the mom and the dad are both the head, but the, fa- the headship's on the father from Adam. The responsibility is mainly on him. It's expected from Scripture that the father needs to correct the children because the sonship of children is connected to fatherhood through discipline here. In fact, if you don't correct your child, if you don't discipline your children, your child is illegitimate, is what it calls it. That word illegitimate in the Greek is nathos, which means illegitimate bastard. One born not in lawful wedlock, but of a concubine or female slave. That's what he's calling your kid if you don't correct him. Why? So what's he saying here? Your kid's an illegitimate bastard if you don't correct him. In other words, if you don't discipline your children, it's as if they don't have parents at all. It's as, as if they don't have any kind of authority watching over them because if there's no discipline, there's no correction of character and so on and so forth. I remember watching this video of somebody filming in a public place. I don't know, maybe it was a mall or something, and there was a mom waiting there, sitting there, and she had a kid. He was maybe five or so. And this kid, this little boy, was like completely disrespecting his mom, yelling at her, hitting her, calling her names, pulling on her clothes, yanking on her, and she was just, she she wasn't doing anything. You know, and I'm... I'm looking at watching this video. I'm like, that boy would not be acting that way if his dad were there. Or chances are the way he's at, why he's acting that way is because he don't have a daddy. And at least in the house, you know, and the mom isn't correcting, disciplining the children. It's like the kid doesn't belong to her illegitimate child running amok. And there's no correction. And it shows this boy. I was like, this boy needs a father in his life. Smack some sense into him. You don't talk to women like that. You don't talk to anybody like that. And you definitely don't talk to your mother that way. Treat her that way. Hit your mother. I mean, come on. The list goes on, right? Now, here's the thing. Some people, especially especially in our modern, politically correct age we're in, are against spanking their children. They, they, they equate it with child abuse. You're, you're hitting your kid. It's child abuse. And the government many times tries to get, pry through your front door like they are with homeschooling and other things and saying you can and cannot do things. Now, I understand there is child abuse, legitimate child abuse, but I think it's a false equivocation to say that you're spanking your children for discipline purpose is therefore child abuse. It's a false equivocation because it's about intent, It's just like if I'm going hunting and somebody walks in the front of me somehow and I'm shooting a duck and I kill them, that intent is different than if I pulled a gun on somebody and murdered them in cold homicide, right? Doing the same thing. Someone's getting shot with a gun and I'm dying. The intent of the action is completely different and it determines the outcome. So if I'm spanking my child out of love uh, for discipline, it's correction. That's not child abuse. Now, I don't want to belittle abuse that people have suffered from, either maybe from childhood or maybe from a bad marriage. Abuse is a real thing. It's always wicked. There's never a good time for abuse. But abuse, just like somebody pulling a gun, intent to murder somebody, abuse is always with the intent to harm somebody. Whether it's physical, emotional, verbal, There's never a disciplined manner behind abuse. It's always with the intent to hurt somebody. But disciplining your kids, it should be out of love, and it's with intents to correct them. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But Proverbs 29.15, it says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left himself brings shame to his mother. Just like that video I saw. A child left himself, a child without discipline, brings shame to his mother, disrespecting his mom. Shameful, embarrassing event. Proverbs twenty two fifteen folly is bound up in the heart of the child, but the rod of discipline drives 
it far from him. Anybody who's got a kid knows that there's foolishness bound up in the heart of a kid, right? And sometimes a little spanking drives it far out from him. Temper tantrums, the rod of discipline drive it far from him. The truth is, is that many times, and here's the truth, adults, kids, that we need to feel something, pain, in order for us to get our act together. It's called hitting rock bottom as you're an adult. Ain't nobody spanking you. You just got to learn the hard way, right? We've all been there, one form or another. You got to feel something called pain before you get some sense knocked into you. And many people hit rock bottom before that happens. Children need to sense a little danger and pain from someone who loves them, someone who loves them, in order to get a little sense knocked into them. It doesn't change from childhood to adulthood. The difference is, as a, a parent, we control it out of love, as where life is unpredictable. And sometimes it knocks us a lot harder than we want to. But we'll get into God's discipline in a little bit. But first, we're on parents. When I was a kid, in my adolescence, when I was just a strapping young lad, uh, in my adolescence, uh, there's this time where I was, uh, me and my sister were going at it a little extra, and um, my dad had enough of it. So one day, he told us to come in the garage didn't tell us what he was doing. Uh, we got spanked our whole lives, and I'm fine. Uh, but he pulled us in the garage, and he didn't tell us what we were doing, uh, what he was doing. And so he gets a uh, piece of fence um, that he had somewhere. Who keeps extra fence around, I guess? But my dad did. You know, like the, the one-by-five piece of board. So he lays it down, and he starts cutting it up. And we're sitting there in silence. We don't know what's going on. Eventually, as time goes by, we see something starting to form. That's a paddle, right? Yeah. It's a paddle. It's probably about this long. I had a picture of one that looks similar to it. But it's about this long. And he's cutting the handle down. And he's sanding it, you know, because we don't want to get splinters in that thing. But And as we're seeing this, this... We know what's coming, right? I mean, he's making the, and we're sitting there in silence. And then he starts drilling holes in the thing. Now, here's a tip for parents that I learned uh, from the other end, uh, is that when you drill holes in it, it, there's less wind resistance on the swing. You know what I'm saying? You don't want, you want that quick snap, you know, so you drill the holes in it so the wind could go right there. And it makes this whistling sound that strikes fear into the soul of any child. Swap! It gives you about a half second to prepare, but it doesn't really help. Um, so anyways, I got hit with that thing probably about twice, and then I, I, was, I think that was the last thing I ever got. Uh, but, you know, you may not have had a piece of fence. You may have had a spoon or a belt or a chancla, right? Guaracha, whatever. There you go. Which I heard is more deadly than a piece of uh, fence, right? There's some sort of uh, magical power to the chancla. Uh, so... <laughs> and uh so and what oh one thing i want to add is that he wrote on there the rod of discipline right just to throw a little salt in the wound you know what i'm saying like i'm gonna i'm hitting you with scripture so it's in the bible <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the bible right and he like put the reference on there so uh yeah chapter and verse oh yeah he got it Chapter and verse, so we knew uh, what was going on. So, and you know that famous saying, parent, we've, you've either heard it or you said it, this will hurt me more than it'll hurt you, right? You're like, yeah, okay, let's switch spots then, huh, if you believe that. Uh, but, you know, you don't realize what that means until you're the parent, right? It's because we never, we never should discipline from anger. We discipline from love um, because... Uh, that's, that's why it hurts us more than it hurts him because we're doing it from a loving heart and we have to inflict pain for a lesson, for discipline. And uh, I remember the first time I spanked Angelo and Maley. Um, and I remember I was like, I was nervous 
and uh, more so with Angelo, because he was a little bit older back then, but um, well, older than Maley. And, uh, and I was like, Lorraine was like, you got to do this, you know, because he got sent to his room for something. She's like, you got to do this, you know, I'm stepping up to the big leagues, you know what I mean? And I, I was like, yeah, I know, I got to do this. And I was like, had a little pep talk, and then I walked down the hallway, and then I was like just standing at the door, you know, like pacing a little bit you know, trying to figure out, you know, how I'm going to approach this. And then I would walk back to her, and she's like, is it done yet? I'm like, no, you know, just don't rush me on this, you know. I checked back in with her, for, I checked back in with headquarters uh, for some more advice, you know, all clear. So anyways, I went in there, and, you know, it isn't a pleasant thing, but, you know, if you're ever in the heat of something, you need to step away and come back to correct, because you don't want to correct in anger, you know, from a clear mind, and explain to them why, why this is happening, you know what I mean, this is what you did, um, this is why I'm correcting you, because I love you, and I don't want you to see you go down a path that you shouldn't, um, now, since Gra- once Grace was born, I was like a pro, <laughs> right, <laughs> I was a pro. Th- I was in the big leagues, you know, no problem. But uh, <laughs> in Proverbs twenty three thirteen through fourteen, it says, "Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. Don't fail to discipline your children. It's not going to kill them to give them a spanking." Physical discipline may well save them from death. Why? It's because them learning, remember, humans got to feel pain to get some, for something to click, right? And if you, if you catch them lying, stealing, cheating, you say, I'm, I don't want to see you go down a path that eventually could lead to further harm or death, Right? Because stealing a, a pack of gum now that costs two bucks and it doesn't get nipped in the bud right right now will turn into stealing money, bank robbery, whatever it is, destroying someone's life, breaking and entering, shootout, jail, whatever, right? It's, it's no wonder, I don't have the statistics in front of me, that the majority of people in prisons, is, they don't have fathers in the home. The overwhelming majority, I wish I, sh- I should have got that statistic. I just not thought of it now. But, yeah, so um, it's done from love. Correction won't kill them now, but it can save them from death later on in, in a path of destruction, right? Discipline them concerning certain things uh, can keep them from dangers even later on and. Proverbs 22, 6, you probably know this, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they grow older, they will not depart from it. So when you train them up in morals, by the time they get older, they're going to hold on to these morals. Now, we know the kids are going to grow up, and they're going to make their own choices, and you can't force things. You gotta, they're going to have to choose Jesus, right? There's going to have to be a transformation in their own hearts, because right now they're falling in their footsteps, uh, but they're going to have to make that, and you train them up with morals, they're going to hold on to that. It's not a promise from God. It's a good principle that is usually always works. Uh, and it could go the vice versa. You raise an atheist household with no morals, that's going to show later on in life too. Now, always God could transform that. But here's the thing. Love isn't always equal acceptance, right? If, a kid, if my kids do something wrong, I don't accept it because I love them. It's because I love them, I don't accept harmful things in their lives. And if they grow older and they're no longer under my roof and they're living a way that they shouldn't, I could say, look, I don't agree with your lifestyle. I love you. That will never change. You're still my kid. But I don't agree with it. I'm not going to support it. And I'm not going to bless you if you live a continual life of whatever this is, drug use or, you know, whatever it could be. I don't have to give you my blessings anymore. That door doesn't necessarily have to be open. I'll I'll love you unconditionally, and that will never change. But the spanking can't continue, but the discipline can in different forms, right? Being cut off from your family is a hurtful thing. But it will make you look into your life and say, am I living my life correctly? I know my parents didn't raise me this way. I I know I'm not right with the Lord. 
in a reflection and you can make a choice left path or right path. You know what I'm saying? So verse 9 and through 10, um, besides this, it says, uh, besides this, we had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the fathers of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. So discipline brings forth respect. Amen. Discipline, your children, makes, you res- makes them respect you. Because if anybody had a mother or father who didn't speak up on injustices, who let things slide... When you did bad things or people did bad things to you, there's a lack of respect there because this is my dad. He should have said something. He should have done something. He should have stopped this, and he didn't, and it creates a lack of respect. So when there is that, regardless if it's we make faults, right, parents? Our correction and discipline isn't perfect because we're not perfect, but we do the best with what we got in the circumstances that we're in, but there's respect that's given and created through the children and may not be shown right there. They may resent you a little bit for the discipline in whatever form that is, but you know when they grow up, they will respect because my mom, my dad had boundaries and moral standards and they didn't compromise on them and they let me know. And I respect them for that. Although I may not agree of how they reacted with everything, I know that they were doing the best that they could have. And you know that the best when you're in their shoes, right? Once you become a parent, it become, uh, becomes a big realization. So I, when I was a youth pastor, there was a youth who came to me, and she didn't have a dad. She lived in a trailer with her mom and her brother and someone else, and basically anything went. There was no discipline. There was no parental supervision. She could eat whatever she want, drink whatever she want, have boys over, drugs, didn't matter. And the mom pretty much provoked a lot of that on because she was helping her, you know, mature, right? Um, so, and so she said, she would tell me, like, for dinner, she could just grab some Oreos and a Gatorade. And, the, you know, there was no discipline in the house. And she would tell me, act out to get a reaction from her mom because she wanted discipline. She told me this. She wanted it because discipline shows love. I'm not going to let my kids do whatever because I love them. She wanted to feel loved. See, it's it's completely the opposite effect that the worldly perspective has. I'm going to buy them cigarettes and I'm going to give them drugs. I'm going to have, they can have boys or girls over. It's the opposite effect that they think it's doing. I want to know my parents care for me to keep me from danger. Discipline me. I'm acting out, la, 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 la. And see, even kids who don't get disciplined, they can't verbalize that to you. They don't know how they're feeling. So they're, ah, because they want that love through discipline. They don't know that's exactly what they want, but they want it. They want to know that the people in authority over them are controlling them to some extent. When they're under our roofs and they're especially underage, there are responsibility. And even later on, that never goes away. I mean, even if your kids aren't even around you, your responsibility to cover them in prayer is the very least responsibility that you have. Continual prayer especially if they aren't right with the Lord. So punishment, discipline is always equals respect in some sense, especially coming from the father because the father carries uh, authority on him more than the mother. Let me just run a quote by you. Has your mom ever said, just wait till your father gets home? And you, know, and you know what? That word father always came out in slow motion, right? Just wait till your father gets home. And all of a sudden, time slowed down, right? Because you know your dad had, could whoop you harder, carries more authority. We may have a bad taste in our mouth from discipline if we were ever subject to abuse in our life. 
And you may say, I'll never hit my kid because I was hit as a kid, and I understand that. And I don't want to belittle abuse of any kind because it's always wicked. I understand that. I have compassion if that's your view. But I did want to point out that discipline is biblical, and there's a way to do it from love. And maybe you experience injustice in the discipline in your life. It doesn't mean that that discipline is wrong altogether. Now, verse 10 For they disciplined us for a short time as it seems best to them, earthly parents. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Now God, our father, also disciplines his children. Now here's the thing. We had imperfect parents who disciplined us imperfectly. We have a perfect father who's perfect in love, perfect in justice, perfect in discipline. He never goes too far. He's never unjust in his judgment. And he never withholds love from us. So when God disciplines us, we can't let the insecurities of our past overshadow God's perfect discipline in our lives. God's perfect love in our lives. Because if we have a God who's perfect in every way, a Father in Heaven who's perfect in every way, His discipline for sure would reflect that perfection and holiness. See, all of us want God's love, but not most of us want His discipline and correction. But many times His love, just as parents, is manifested through discipline given the context. So when God disciplines us in our lives, for being disobedient, for having sin that clings to us because we're sinking. Just know that it's a perfect discipline. We deserve it. We could try to rationalize away from it and try to deny things, but you can't deny that his discipline and his love through that discipline is perfect. You can't deny that. And if it's perfect, then it's exactly right for you in that time. And we should take heed to that. Amen, church? Proverbs 12.1 says this, and I'm coming to an end. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. The Bible, <laughs> the Bible says you're stupid if you don't take heed to discipline and reproof that God gives you. It's a stupid thing. Why? Because you're harming yourself. You're in a bad relationship. And six months down the road, it's a complete disaster. And you say, God, how did this happen? Well, let's rewind. Uh, You're unequally yoked, so you disregarded what I said in the Word. Um, You didn't take heed to wise counsel to your friends and loved ones around you. And you didn't uh, acknowledge the Spirit uh, giving you uh, checks and red flags through this whole relationship. So denial, denial, denial. Um, You hit your head. You just got a spanking, so to speak, right? And now you're feeling pain to, ding, reevaluate your situation. I'll have the worship team come on up. Just like parents discipline our kids to keep them from future harm, God many times disciplines us in many different ways. And many times that comes through people just telling us something Like, look, I see this happening in your life. Or from a preacher from a pulpit preaching you something that hits you real good. And it's up to you to take heed to that because if you don't, then it's a stupid thing to do. God is trying to keep you from further harm down the road. In verse 11 it says, For the moment all discipline seems seems painful rather than pleasant. All discipline is painful rather than pleasant. It's not a pleasant to do. Even discipline your kids is not a pleasant thing to do. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We see another athletic word there, trained by it. While going through discipline and suffering and things, may, may, God may be showing you and pruning you, Right? cutting the deadness off of you. It's not pleasant, but if we have a spiritual mind about it and saying, God, what are you trying to bring from this? Look, the pain, the discipline is going to yield with the right heart. It's going to yield peaceful fruit of righteousness. 
Isn't that what we want? To bear peaceful fruit of righteousness, a right standing before God? I'm going to stop there. So, anybody here who, um, I'm just going to pray over you guys. Anybody who needs prayer after service, please, um, me and Pastor Jim will, will be up here. But I just want to pray over you guys for the Holy Spirit maybe to reveal things to you. Uh, maybe things that he's been trying to get your attention about that you've been ignoring. Maybe the wet clothes that have been clinging so tightly to you and you're wondering why. Your race in, in this life with Christianity, with your relationship with God, is always seems exhaustive. It always seems like you're sinking, defeated. I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit just to reveal things to you, and I want you to be receptive to it, because to ignore it is stupid. It's what the Bible says, because it's only going to bring you further harm. So I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you guys right now. Just try to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Father God, we just ask you to come. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and move upon your people, whether here in person or watching online or watching in the future, who knows, years from now. God, we ask you, Lord, just to speak to them right now in this moment. Search us and know us. In order to, to, to search us, we have to open ourselves up to you. So we present ourselves to you with open hands giving you all, and hiding nothing. And say, Holy Spirit, examine us. And if there's any wet clothes, any sin that's clinging tightly to us, or anything that you may be trying to show us, correct us, discipline us, God, we ask you to bring that to the surface right now and to reveal it to us. God, and we take that thing, And we may not know how to overcome it fully right now. But what we do is we present it to you and say, God, I give you this and I want it gone from me. I may not know how, but I'm asking you to show me. I'm tired of being defeated. I'm tired of being pulled down. God, take this from me. I lay it at the foot of the cross. I ask you to take it from me. And I ask you to give me that peaceful fruit of righteousness in return so that I don't go down this path of destruction by holding on to this sin that tangles me. So I give it to you now. Give me wisdom and how to overcome this. I give it to you. Take it from me. In Jesus' name, I ask you to cut all ties, break every chain, remove every weight, every burden. In Jesus' name. Every, um, every heart that suffered from abuse in the past, and there's a stronghold there, I cast it down in Jesus' name. I cast it down in Jesus' name. God, I ask you to restore every mind and every heart that has been damaged by abuse, whether physical, emotional, verbal. I ask you to heal them now and to release forgiveness to those who have violated you. Release forgiveness. You can say their name, you can say it in, their, in your mind or, or whatever. Say their name and say, I forgive you. And release it. Because the Bible, even later on in this chapter, talks about the roots of bitterness. And the roots of bitterness are many times caused by unforgiveness harbored in our hearts. If you're a bitter person towards people, it's probably because you have unforgiveness harbored in your heart. Like a ship that harbors on a dock. So is a ship of unforgiveness in the harbor of your heart. So I want you to say their name and say, I forgive you. And God, I release them towards you. No more harm. No more hurt feelings. I cut the roots of bitterness from my heart in Jesus' name. I release it to you, God, no more. Chains are broken. Burdens are gone in Jesus' name. Any abuse, anything said, cast it down in Jesus' name. And when Satan t- tries to come back and try to remind you what they said, remember that? Remember that? He said, no, I cast that down in Jesus' name. I stand upon God's word because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And guess what? If it's a stronghold, 
that's, that's been there for a while. It might not be victory in one battle. It might have more until you see victory. But guess what? Brick by brick, you'll tear down this stronghold in Jesus' name, right? Amen. Brick by brick, you say, no, in Jesus' name, that's not coming back. I'm victorious in Christ. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. Renew my mind. Renew my heart. And give me the peaceful fruit of righteousness, God. Amen, church? Stand upon that, claim it, and if Satan tries to come back with the stronghold, say, no, it's cast down in Jesus' name. I cast down every vain imagination and bring it to submission under Jesus Christ. Amen, church?